We're going to move chronologically to our next speaker, um, Jack Lynch of Rutgers University of Newark, author of, you can look it up, and the lexicographer's dilemma. That's actually not a challenge, but it's the name of the <laughs> <laughs> uh, So Jack will be talking to us about the uh, complex relationship between Samuel Johnson and Noah Webster. Who pay attention to the history of dictionaries? It's a small population, I know, and probably half of them are in this room today. <laughs> know something of the dictionary wars. The term describes a long running battle between Noah Webster and Joseph Worcester, or more accurately, between the dictionaries that trace their origins to Webster and Worcester, in which literary eminences, political figures, publishing enterprises, and universities were conscripted into the armies on either side. It was a commercial dispute above all, though at stake was which dictionary would set the standard of what Webster liked to call the American language. Spoiler alert, Webster won. <laughs> or again more accurately, the G and C Merriam Company won on the strength of the product they acquired from Webster. It was closely fought through the 19th century, but eventually Webster's became the eponym for linguistic authority in America. Long before the war with Worcester, though, Webster was engaged in another dictionary war, but this time with an enemy who didn't even know he existed. Samuel Johnson and Webster were contemporaries, but they never engaged with one another in life. Webster was born in 1758, which is three years after Johnson's dictionary appeared. Johnson died in 1784, just a year after Webster published his Speller, his first significant work on language. So Webster meant nothing to Johnson, but Johnson meant plenty to Webster. It's hard to appreciate the degree of dominance Johnson's dictionary had achieved by the early 19th century. In legend, it's the first English dictionary, a claim we usually dismiss as vulgar ignorance. In important ways, though, Johnson's really was the first English dictionary. John Dryden, writing late in the 17th century, complained that we have yet no English prosodia, nor so much as a tolerable dictionary or grammar. In fact, a number of dictionaries were available to Dryden, but apparently none met his standards. A half century later, the philosopher and historian David Hume had even more dictionaries to choose from, and yet he too complained that we have no dictionary of our language. And in 1747, William Warburton lamented that we have neither grammar nor dictionary, neither chart nor compass to guide us through the wide sea of words. Things changed with the publication of Johnson's book. Soon after its appearance, no one, not even Johnson's enemies, could say that English lacked a dictionary. It was a book that any self-respecting middle-class family was expected to have on its shelves, at least in one of its original sort of one claiming association with Johnson's dictionary. And by the beginning of the 19th century, Johnson's was a name to conjure with. When Henry Tilney questions Catherine Morland's use of a word in Jane Austen's Northanger Abbey, Eleanor warns, you had better change it as soon as you can, or we shall be overpowered with Johnson. That authority extended everywhere in which it was spoken. Even Americans were overpowered with Johnson. And it wasn't just the dictionary. By the 1790s, Johnson's works were everywhere in America. Jim Basker, whose office is uh, right there. across the street on Broadway, found Johnson by far the most widely available author, English or American, in the American book trade at the end of the 18th century. So this is the world in which Noah Webster decided to write a dictionary. A large work, he said immodestly, which is intended as a substitute 
four Johnsons. Now, he praised his predecessor's great intellectual powers and admitted that his life was changed forever by Johnson's Rambler essays. When I closed the last volume, he told a friend, I formed a firm resolution to pursue a course of virtue through life. But Webster despised Johnson's politics, as Johnson would have despised Webster's. <laughs> the American nation was the sticking point. Johnson once admitted he was willing to love all mankind except an American. <laughs> And he called the rebellion, rebellious colonists a race of convicts who ought to be thankful for anything we allow them short of hanging. <laughs> In 1775, when the patriotic cry from Boston to Savannah was taxation without representation is tyranny, Johnson published a pamphlet called Taxation No Tyranny. He despised the Americans for their disrespect for monarchy, their Republican principles, and their tasteless money growing. And Webster, he was as zealous in support of America as Johnson was in opposition. He even marched to join a battle in the Revolutionary War in 1777, but he arrived right after hostilities had ended. His alma mater, Yale, was described by loyalists as a nursery of sedition of faction and republicanism. In 1785, the year after Johnson's death, Webster published sketches of American policy, agitating for a new constitution to take the place of the Articles of Confederation, and he traveled to Mount Vernon to show it to George Washington. He even took credit for prompting the Annapolis Conference of 1786, the first step toward drafting the US Federal Constitution of 1787. While that constitution was being written in Philadelphia, Webster was nearby, determined always to be close to the action. Now, the political contrasts between the two men weren't absolute. Both were committed abolitionists. Still, they had very little common political ground. And Webster read Johnson's politics into Johnson's dictionary. He prepared the ground for his own work, by finding fault with the earlier book. And his own dictionary was to be an American answer to the greatest monument to English and to Englishness. Despite his praise for Johnson's intellect, therefore, he found his dictionary extremely imperfect and full of error. Not a single page, Webster Bright, is correct. Johnson's history of the language showed he was very imperfectly acquainted with the subject, and his grammar was wretchedly imperfect. As Webster wrote in 1807, the errors in Johnson's dictionary are ten times as numerous as people suspect. <laughs> but here's the thing. Though Webster avowedly saw his dictionary as a critique of, even a replacement for, Johnson, the two dictionaries are strikingly similar. They shared strengths. Johnson's definitions were very good. Webster's were superb. Johnson was an early splitter in defining, seeking out subtle shades of meaning for each word. Webster, though he briefly fell under the spell of the cranky John Horn took and the theory that every word had exactly one meaning, <laughs> became an impressive splitter in his own right, distinguishing 47 senses of the verb to get. Johnson and Webster also shared weaknesses. Johnson's etymologies, constructed on no theoretical basis, were adequate at best. Webster's etymologies, constructed on a fundamentally flawed theoretical basis, <laughs> were downright bad. The two men did differ in their attitudes towards spelling. Johnson tolerated inconsistency, whereas Webster wanted to modify the notoriously irregular orthography of English. And truth be told, he had more success in that project than any other single person has ever had. 
But even here, Johnson and Webster shared a trajectory because Johnson changed over time from firmly interventionist to grudgingly descriptivist, including our orthography, while Webster went from a radical who wanted to new model English spelling from the ground up to a reformer who often accepted compromise. Let me go further still. Webster often cribbed from the figure he liked to disparage. He used the eighth edition of Johnson's Dictionary, published in 1799, as he worked on his first dictionary, Endius Dictionary. His copy of Johnson survives in the New York Public Library. Later, he seems to have consulted the Johnson edition of 1806, the Johnson Todd edition of 1818, and the Chalmers of Richmond of 1820. Half a century ago, Joseph Reed sampled 2,024 words, containing a total of 4,505 meanings from Webster's great American Dictionary, his major accomplishment. And he compared Webster's definitions with Johnson's. He regretted that he had to do a representative sample, but he admitted that thoroughly reliable conclusions await the time when we are replaced by the kindly and peripatetic Univac. <laughs> Though he was being tongue in cheek, that's not a bad prediction of our age's linguistic methods. Though my phone has the memory of two million high end Univacs from 1962. <laughs> but Reed, working with his sample, estimated that Webster lifted 7% of his definitions directly from Johnson, unaltered. Acknowledging his source, by the way, less than one time in 20. Another 22% of Webster's dictionaries are clearly borrowed from Johnson with just the alteration of a word or two. And when he added up the verbatim borrowings, the slight alterations, and the definitions paraphrased from Johnson, Reed concluded that one in three of Webster's definitions owed a clear debt to his predecessor. That's a remarkably high proportion. But what about Johnson's quotations, which Webster had also criticized at length for their injudicious selection, their toleration of bodiness, their Latinity, but above all, their Britishness? Webster has far fewer quotations, and he often allows authors' names alone to do the work of extracts. Mm -hmm. But Reed's sample shows that, get this, 66% of Webster's citations come from Johnson. Though he made a big deal about inserting American authors into his illustrative canon, in practice he did that very little. Most of Webster's new citations were either to the Bible, Johnson's most cited book, or to recent scientific and technical authors. In fact, Webster's borrowing from Johnson begins on his title page. What is an American Dictionary of the English Language? But Johnson's title, A Dictionary of the English Language, with the word American <laughs> ostentatiously wedged in there. And lest you think that the title is so obvious that it could hardly be avoided, no early, uh, earlier lexicographer had made A Dictionary of the English Language prominent in its title, with the sole exception of Thomas Sheridan, Johnson's sometimes friend and sometime rival, who was working on the rival part of his identity when he sneered at Johnson's book with his own complete dictionary of the English language. So what can we take from this about Webster and Johnson? Well, the real difference between the two had very little to do with the English language and very much to do with the American nation. Webster explicitly saw lexicography as an ideological enterprise. As he put it in his spelling book, the author wishes to promote the honor and prosperity of the Confederated Republics of America and cheerfully throws his might into the common treasure of patriotic exertion. But while his paradox, his front matter is and his correspondence are relentlessly tough on Johnson. Webster's patriotic dictionary itself 
is an inadvertent tribute to Tory lexicography. <laughs> what is billed as an anti-Johnson is in fact closer to Johnson Mark II. This isn't to say Webster's dictionary was apolitical, quite the opposite, but his most important political gesture was not inside the book. It was simply claiming the authority to issue a dictionary from the United States at all, to assert American rights over the English language. Webster's way of sticking it to Johnson was to do what he did, sometimes worse, usually better, from the other side of the Atlantic. Thanks. When Webster said that Johnson had made these mistakes of the issues of, of tone, do you know what an example would have been? Was Johnson just flubbed? What was The sort thing of, he complained about the most, that were supposedly clear flubs, was Johnson's etymology. Now, Johnson was a prodigiously learned individual, but he did not have any, well, like predates Sir William Jones, it's systematic Indo European. Um, Linguistic, historical linguistics. So he just depended on what he knew of languages to come up with his etymologies. And whenever it was time for something difficult, Johnson took his best guess. And he was often wrong, sometimes embarrassing. Webster spent decades studying this in great detail, and everything he did was wasted effort because he was working from a fundamentally flawed system. So Webster's most pointed accusations where Johnson was simply factually wrong. He was almost always wrong there. John, and Webster spent more time criticizing Johnson's values and his politics and his, he, he thought he tolerated Shakespeare too much. Shakespeare was too naughty. Um, he complained that Johnson admitted too much from books like Pseudodoxia Epidemica, which he said are not English, and so on. Uh, so he criticized Johnson for being the wrong kind of person. And that's open for, for argument. But in general, where he said something was flat out wrong, Johnson usually was right by accident. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, you mentioned the comparative analysis that was done by hand. Do you know if anyone has made an effort to update that? No, and I was, as I was just preparing this, uh, because I read that article many years ago, just returned to my notes on it. So, oh, you know, nowadays this should be possible. Um, the frustrating situation with Johnson's dictionary is a friend of mine, Anne McDermott, worked for a decade and a half to do a scrupulously tagged XML version of Johnson's Dictionary, tracking down everything, and worked very hard to put it online, and then technical problems took it down, and it's been a decade, and it's not available. So we've got bad online text, but we don't have a really good text of Johnson online to work with, unless you want to nag and see if she's... And does it have that now? And the, yes, there's news this week that, uh, that, it's, not open that it's, yeah, it's becoming open access. Um, do you know if they've done tagging of X and all that sort of thing in the dictionary? I haven't had a chance to do it. Rebecca, who? Um, yeah. Sorry, lexicon of early modern English has um, it's expanded into the 18th century, and so it's not, no longer early modern, but we do have an associate editor, and it's um, Johnson, Johnson is. The latest big picture that's been included. So it's L E M E, and it was just announced this week that it's all going to be open access. Yeah, they've got an enormous grant book. Canadians still value education. <laughs> <laughs> is that the University of Toronto? This is more a comment than a question. Um, many people think dictionaries are disembodied that don't exist in the social context. And there are so many dictionary wars, and there are so many political issues surrounding dictionaries in every country, not just England and the United States. So it's, if you dig into that, you can go on forever. So I think you're exactly right. And 
the Webster Worcester thing has claimed the name in English dictionary war, but it, it's a bigger subject than that. To my mind, one of the most interesting things about the Webster Johnson controversy happens after both of them are dead. Because in Johnson is famously a Londoner, and London was the center of the Anglophone world through the 18th century. And in the late 18th, early 19th century, Americans are still apologetic about their language. They would, if they published lists of Americanisms, it was to conceal them. Webster was unusual in asserting his control over, but most of the world still saw America as a little <laughs> outpost that got to borrow the real language. 1850, so 22 years after Webster's Great Dictionary, Right around then, American population passes British population. And the center of gravity of the English language moves across the Atlantic. And now it becomes a much bigger story about nationalism. Who, who owns this thing? It's no longer a few islands off the northwest coast of Europe. And that time frame, so the 1860s, when the Civil War took yep. place in the United States, is when in Russia was published the first dictionary of American slang. So yes, yes. So it, it spread across the world. In that sense. Yeah. Well, one of the things that Donna and I have in common is uh, former professors in world Englishness, and uh, one of the things that I uh, so one of Donna's professors was the professor of my professor. So. Um, one of the things that I found particularly wonderful about reading um, the front end of uh, the Compendious Dictionary is that Johnson talks about how um, shortly, uh, in the near future, there will be dictionaries and languages of the Caribbean. There will be different Englishes, and um, that English will no longer be owned by the English, and that every um, other English-speaking country will have their own Language. And that took a surprisingly long time. But it did happen. But it did happen. You know, Australia and Canada took a while before they got their own right. homegrown dictionaries. But we're we're getting there now with most of the world. Other questions? I have I have one comment, one question. Um, the comment is uh, from the preface of the eighteen oh six, the Webster. Um, he makes one claim that I, I just think is astonishing, which is that he, in 1806, says that American English will one day be the dominant form, yeah. and in fact will be spoken by 300 millions of people, yes. which is <laughs> astonishing to assert in 1806 when we had barely survived the election of 1800 yeah. and were about to go to war again with England. So that, that's just an amazing piece of bravado. Um, to you, I, I, I would like to ask about the personalities that is, are reflected in, in the text. Everybody knows about Johnson's personality as it's expressed in his wit, um, in the, even in the dictionary. What do you see in Webster of his personality? I mean, he's such a sour man, and, and, and sometimes that comes through. Uh, but, I mean, do, do you see a, an attempt to, um, to sort of suppress, to, to be more kind of formal and less uh, personable? <laughs> I, I think that's part of it, and what does come through of him is something that is still perceived by a big audience today, which is the conservative Christianity, conservative, uh, let's say, ancestor of today's conservative Christianity, which wasn't necessarily conservative in 1820. Um, but it, there are still homeschoolers who worship that book. And it's available, in fact, similarly. It has this strange parallel life that the lexicographical world knows very little about. But it's still a living work for some of those. But it is true that Johnson is known as a larger-than-life personality. Webster doesn't have that. I think he largely withdraws in his book and gives us just his, his conception of what lexicography should be rather than these personal quirks coming through. They're in there, but you have to look for them. I don't yeah, there are, there are sermons in certain entries. You yes. Like father and love and certain things. They're ab ab actual sermons. Um, yes, and he has the, the secular equivalent of sermons when he introduces American political terms right. and things like that, and, and scientific language and so on. He's got a very progressive notion um, of how American technology is going to run the world. But 
that feels more like a, a conscious decision than a personality quirk. To it was a voice of authority that he was yeah. adopting. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Lexicography without the gout. <laughs> That's Anna, not me. Okay, well, thank you very much. Yeah.